As an African proverb goes, a friend is someone you share the path with. On the path to modernization, no one and no country should be left behind. Let us rally the more than 2.8 billion Chinese and African people into a powerful force on our shared path toward modernization. Promote modernization of the global south with China-Africa modernization. And write a new magnificent chapter of development in human history. Let us join hands to bring about a bright future of peace, security, prosperity, and progress for our world. Thank you. The curtains have come down on the ninth forum on China-Africa cooperation of FOCAC. Heads of state and government and delegations from the People's Republic of China and 53 African countries, along with the chairperson of the African Union Commission, gathered in Beijing to chart the future of China and Africa. In 24 years, FOCAC has emerged as a key platform for South-South cooperation, overcoming global challenges and setting the stage for common prosperity. In this special edition of Talk Africa, we unpack the outcomes of the just concluded summit, focusing on the commitments that will shape Africa's development trajectory and take a glimpse at what lies ahead for China and Africa. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. And we have a lot to unpack. So let's bring in our panel of experts. Joining us here in Nairobi, Dr. Adere Cavins, China-Africa expert. In Johannesburg, Dr. Emmanuel Matambo, research director at the University of Johannesburg. And in Beijing, Professor John Gong, professor at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. A very warm welcome to you all, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us in this uh, discussion. Now, uh, Beijing has hosted the largest uh, diplomatic gathering with leaders and representatives of 53 African countries attending the FOCAC Summit uh, 2024. I want to first uh, get your key takeaways uh, from the summit. Let me start off with you, Dr. Adere. Yes, uh, African leaders and Chinese counterparts have just concluded one of the most dynamic uh, meetings uh, happening every three years in Beijing, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. And it was really great to see a revitalized energy uh, from both sides to carry on the cooperation and elevate the partnership even to newer levels. Uh, it's coming at a time when Africa is expectant of so many development aspirations and as well as Chinese who are also uh, repositioning themselves as uh, anchors of global economic development. So uh, it's great to see uh, the two sides uh, amplifying their voices, uh, re-strategizing, uh, and also coming together with new pathways of uh, development that can deliver value to the people of both sides. Professor Gong, your takeaways? Well, I think this is a very important event both for China and for uh, Africa. Um, you know, we have 50-some heads of states coming to Beijing, and it's a, a big event. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me tell you that uh, there's a bit of a traffic jam in the last two days, but that's okay. Uh, I think people are um, very confident to see in the uh, great hall of People's Congress that uh, there are uh, such a large audience, I think at least a thousand people sitting in the, in the hall. Most of them, I think, are from Africa. Um, and, um, you know, hearing, uh, looking at the audience, giving rounds and rounds of applause to President Xi's speech uh, speaks volume about uh, the status of cooperation between China and Africa. Uh, and I think uh, looking at President Xi's speech, um, it is clear that you know, it's not all about rhetorics. It's, I mean, the speech is full of concrete action items, 10 action items uh, that are uh, uh, really going to be having an impact on Africa, including infrastructure projects, uh, small and beautiful projects, uh, as well as uh, mm -hmm. you know, other areas of cooperation, uh, including even in security. Uh, cooperation. 
right, Dr. Matambo, your take? There are three things I would like to talk about, and they are mostly drawn from the tone that was set by President Xi Jinping's first uh, speech at Fokakaya. The first thing is that China still identifies itself as part of the developing world, of which Africa is a part as well, and that is quite important in reinforcing the relationship that Africa shares with China. The second thing I'd like to talk about is the fact that China has decided, uh, China in consonant uh, with Africa has decided to elevate the relationship that Af China has with Africa to a relationship of strategic uh, partnerships, obviously excluding the kingdom of Eswatini. That was quite important. The third thing is the, the 10 point actions that uh, President Xi Jinping alluded to. I will go into the details uh, about that, but one of the most outstanding standing thing obviously is the prioritization of Africa's youth and Africa's women as well as China partners with the African continent. We are the youngest continent and that is the most important resource that we have. So let me go back to the 10-point uh, plan unveiled uh, by China there, a partnership of action for modernization to deepen China-Africa cooperation in the next uh, three years. Professor Gong, from China's perspective, what is your understanding of a joint pursuit of modernization? The theme of this year's summit is all about uh, modernization in Africa. And, and I think uh, there's a, a plenty of room of cooperation uh, in which China can play an you know, important role. I think from Africa's perspective, uh, modernization practically just means uh, industrialization, in my view. From an economist's point of view, industrialization um, as well as um, manufacturing. You know, this is uh, uh, practically every country's um, path to uh, prosperity. You look at China's experience, you look at, you know, countries like Japan, South Korea, um, uh, uh, Taiwan, um, you know, all these countries and, and region, of course, uh, has um, arrived at a certain stage of development via manufacturing and, and, and by also attracting foreign direct investment uh, mm -hmm. uh, from other countries and for exports oriented uh, uh, commercial opportunities. And I think uh, you know, Africa is going to be more or less the same. Now, I want to point out that uh, today um, Africa's position vis-a-vis -vis China is very much like China's position in the 19 late 1980s and 1990s, vis-a-vis -vis the West, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, United States and uh, uh, the European Union, for example. I think this time it's the difference is that China is sitting at the other end of the table. We are waiting for opportunities to make foreign direct investment in Africa, you know, set up manufacturing activities and bring the goods back to China as well as to the rest of the world. You know, this right. is really the model of China's success in the past and I hope the model can also extend to Africa for many people over there. Dr. Matam, I want to stay a little bit more on the 10-point action plan, which included a raft of commitments made in areas ranging from trade, healthcare, industrialization, uh, green development, to as far as security and people-to-people -people exchanges. What is the most urgent and what should be a priority for Africa here? Uh, some of the things that we could actually prioritize upon, for example, was the eighth plan that spoke about the people-to-people -people relations between Africa and China. That, and that is the, is the offering of about 60,000 training uh, priorities uh, for mostly Africa's youth and Africa's uh, women. I think we should prioritize that because in FOCAC, we should not forget that the biggest and most important stakeholder are ordinary Chinese and ordinary Africans. So yes, we, we, we have to, those have to be trained and also we have to prioritize infrastructure on the African continent. That has been the big, one of the biggest limitations to the continent's development. Let me come to you, Professor Gong, because the two sides talked a lot about deepening linkages between the Belt and Road Cooperation and the African Union Agenda 2063. Now, one of the commitments made was a plan to carry out 30 new infrastructure projects across Africa, focusing more on smaller, more efficient projects that integrate advanced and green technologies. Is there a shift from big infrastructural projects? First of all, you know, infrastructure projects are extremely important. I think, you know, these are the basis for industrialization, basis for manufacturing. You know, without electricity, for example, how can you do manufacturing? Without port facilities, how can you ship the goods out, right? So, of course, you know, infrastructure is extremely important. And in our own experience here in China, we, noticed, we, we understand 
that uh, you know the importance of infrastructure. We spent heavily to build up infrastructure in the 1990s and earlier 2000, and now we're actually reaping the benefits of that. So I, I think it's extremely important. But on the other hand, I think. Um, you know, the, the infrastructure projects are usually long-term projects and, and they usually are quite expensive and take on a, a fair amount of a debt on, on the host countries. Uh, so I think in addition to this, we need to also take into consideration, you know, the, the debt level that each country is that can be, can be carried out and, and, and be sustainable over the long run. So I think in addition to these very expensive, long-term oriented infrastructure projects, we can also start with something small, mm -hmm. something concerning small and medium-sized businesses, um, you know, to generate opportunities for, um, uh, you know, a, a small-time business, even farmers. I think, you know, there are plenty of opportunity, in my view, in, in areas of agriculture, in areas of electronic commerce, in terms of, you know, bringing uh, African uh, products, local products, agricultural products directly to Chinese consumers mm -hmm. uh, using the uh, e-commerce infrastructure we're actually building across borders in Africa. So you know, these are the kind of things that uh, uh, we can start out with uh, even if we haven't really um, accomplished all the uh, infrastructure needs uh, in Africa. It's a, it's a huge appetite for these infrastructures uh, to catch up with the level of say Western countries and I think it's a long way to go. But uh, you know, we shouldn't be held hostage for that for that mm -hmm. long term uh, 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 time frame. But, but I think you know we can start with something more concrete, something having an impact on, on local people. And I think that's what this you know, idea is coming from. Uh, and I think there are many opportunities we can do together. Dr. Adere, I want to get your thought on the new funding pledges to Africa. Now, President Xi Jinping announced a fifty-one billion dollars in new funding. 30 billion in credit lines and 10 billion in new Chinese investments. What do you make of this and what does this mean for the continent? And so Chinese involvement in Africa's infrastructure, in my view, has been a very constructive, uh, not just at the bilateral level, but also inspiring some of these other initiatives, such as the Global Gateway or the Partnership for Infrastructure um, uh, Investments in, in, in the developing world uh, that is fronted by the G20. Uh, so we are also looking at a scenario where the commitments by China now totaling over $50 billion in the next uh, three years, it's not just looking at uh, the, the hardcore infrastructure as you know it, you know, the railways or the roads, but also uh, part of the funding is supposed to help, for example, internationalization of Chinese farms in Africa, thereby creating opportunities not just for China but also for the African people, including creation of the one million jobs that uh, uh, President Xi referenced during his address to the FOCAC. So this funding that is coming to Africa, um, it's up to African agency now to organize themselves in a manner that uh, ensures that the funds are absorbed in more functional, more productive, more sustainable projects that can actually deliver value in the long run. Um, it's also a break from the past where a lot of talk has already been uh, going on about slowdown in Chinese financial commitments to Africa. I think we are seeing an uptick and a demonstration that China is still you know, all in when it comes to Africa's economic transformation. So I believe that uh, the funding that has been uh, proposed by President Xi mm -hmm. is going to uh, play a very important role, especially as Africa repositions as the next frontier of development for the world. Dr. Matam, I want to look a little bit more about the absorption of, of that funding. How do African countries, though, access this funding? What criteria is used to determine who gets these funds? Most of the times when uh, funding actually comes from China, um, well, people should understand that it is not usually in terms of, uh, of, of cash payments. It is usually in terms of the services that the Chinese would, would put across. If there is infrastructure, for example, most of the times it would be uh, companies that bid, obviously, to build that particular, particular infrastructure. Therein, by the way, lies one of the probably uh, smaller fault lines when it comes to the investment that China is likely to make on the African continent. Mm -hmm. President Xi Jinping uh, did something instructive by mentioning the African Union and mentioning Agenda 2063, which is the framework that the African Union uses to integrate the continent using infrastructure. Because it is only if Africa negotiates as the African continent in its relations, by the way, with other uh, various partnerships in the world, that whatever happens would work to the, uh, to, to the benefit of Africa as a whole. But I guess uh, that is something obviously that will be discussed between African partners and, uh, and, and the People's Republic of China. But I think it, as, as long as Africans continue 
to uh, negotiate in silos to extract these deals at a bilateral level, then there will not be a lot of foresight in whatever China does because Africa cannot really negotiate on an equal footing if it will continue negotiating as individual countries because if, if China uh, still associates itself with the developing world, only the, 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 those who are naive could think as if China is still at the same level that it was at uh, 40 years ago. All right, gentlemen, on that note, we're going to take a short break. And when we return, we'll have more on the just concluded FOCAC summit in Beijing. To stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to Talk Africa, and let's continue with our discussion. Still with me, Dr. Adere Cavins, China-Africa expert, Dr. Emmanuel Matambo, research director at the University of Johannesburg, and Professor John Gong, professor at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. Let me start off with you, Professor Gong, here, because President Xi Jinping announced that all African countries having diplomatic ties with China be elevated to an all-weather China-Africa community with a shared future for the new era. How do you interpret the significance of this from a political and geopolitical perspective? Well, I think the adjective uh, all weather uh, is, a, is a heavily loaded word in my view. Uh, you know, there are not many countries before that that qualify as uh, China's uh, all weather um, partner uh, in areas of uh, diplomatic relations. And I think, uh, you know, just with so many countries all of a sudden moving into that category, uh, shows the extent of China's um, willingness uh, to uh, cooperate with Africa, China's commitment uh, to Africa. Um, and and I, think, I think one of the defining um, feature associated with this phrase, in my view, um, is in areas of um, uh, security operation. Uh, you know, if you look at the previously the countries that have a, such kind of a relationship with China, uh, they all share some kind of uh, cooperation, uh, you know, with China in that area. Uh, and I think, um, you know, the tenth, I, I, if I remember this correctly, the tenth action item refers to to that aspect. Um, and and it's, it's, it, it is, you know, said in a very general way, that means that China is willing to, you know, provide uh, security and, and, and defense related uh, assistance uh, engaging uh, cooperative uh, activities with African countries, uh, you know, all the countries that have established diplomatic relations with China, of course. Uh, and, and I think that's, a, that's, a, that's something to be, um, you know, not easy in my view. Uh, I, I, that reminds me of um, Deng Xiaoping's words, you know, quite a few years, many years ago um, when he was still alive. And he said that, uh, you know, China will be forever on the side of the developing world. I think, you know, when he made that statement, he's referring to the, uh, the prospect that China is going to be uh, economically moving more towards a developed camp, mm -hmm. industrialized world camp. But, you know, he still said that we will be forever on the, on the developing country side. And I think, uh, you know, that statement uh, from President Xi in that speech uh, really uh, highlights, you know, the importance of that. Uh, and I think there's a, a, a certainly a consistency of China's foreign policy uh, in, in that area. Dr. Adere, from where you sit, how significant is this and what is the implication for a geopolitics and a political stance for Africa? Well, I think we see it from Africa as a, you know, a continuation of Chinese uh, foreign policy of uh, respect for other countries, equality, and a desire to strengthen its collaboration and political partnership with Africa. You know, China, despite its political size, despite its economic might uh, in the world stage, is willing to embrace African countries, most of which are still very young in terms of economic uh, uh, viability. And I think this is a, a testament to the African side that China is still willing to champion the interest of developing countries collectively. And Beijing is driving a, a new narrative where international relations should be based on true multilateralism, 
uh, should be based on um, true friendship and, 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 and clear interest of every other party irrespective of their political size and economic might in, in, in the world. And this is a, a clear um, a statement to African countries in terms of which partners uh, they have in the international system. There are partners that are willing to embrace them despite their sizes, and yet there are other partners which are uh, uh, pegging their partnership with Africa on conditions. Uh, and so in terms of uh, influencing Africa's uh, geopolitical orientation, I think it was a very good messaging point. It was a point for Africa that in China they have a partner that looks um, at them at, on, on equal measure, that is willing to embrace them at their points of need, and uh, a, a, you know, a partner that is uh, willing to listen to them, to take care of their interests, and to champion an inclusive uh, form of international relations that delivers peace and development at the end. Dr. Matambo, I do want to uh, allude to go back to President Xi Jinping's speech because he did also allude to China's relations with African nations as now being at its best in history. What exactly does this mean and what has changed since the last uh, FOCAC summit? There has been this creeping in of insular politics in the Western world. I mean, the two fundamental uh, demonstrations of that was the withdrawal of Britain from the European Union and then the 2016 uh, election of Donald Trump in the United States was also uh, a demonstration of just how the Western world was turning in on itself against the globalization that it had benefited from and that championed, by the way. So the developing world felt as though it was left out in the cold, so to say. And because of that, um, there has been this uh, pulling in of resources from countries in the, in, the, in the developing world. They appreciate even more the fact that we live in a globalized uh, economy. And there is a realization as well that the world, um, as it unfolds, will mm -hmm. mostly be shaped by Africa because we are the smallest continent. I mean, only about 3% of Africans are above the age of 65, and we are, we are poised to double the continent's population by the year 2100. Even Joe Biden, himself the president of the United States, acknowledged as much when he said the future of Africa is the future of the world. So I think that is what uh, China has seen in Africa and, and, and vice versa. So when President Xi Jinping speaks about Africa-China relations being at, at, all, at an all-time high, it is because this has been highlighted by the fact that the international system, the Western uh, side of the international system is withdrawing within itself, and that has highlighted uh, China's relationship with Africa. On top of that, we have seen uh, some synergy at an international level. Right. South Africa was ridiculed, uh, for example, when it took the case against uh, Israel to the International uh, Court of Justice. It was ridiculed by the West. China, on the other hand, um, co-hosted that uh, summit, the special meeting in November 2023 20, with South Africa, when uh, it condemned the actions that, the indiscriminate actions that Israel uh, was perpetrating against the innocent people of Gaza. So those, those are just some of the people that are, some of the issues that have highlighted the importance with which Africa and China currently hold with each other. So I want to get a very brief comment uh, from all of you as we wind up the program. Let me start off with you, Professor Gong. Following the successful conclusion of FOCAC Summit 2024, what do you see as the future of China-Africa cooperation geopolitically and economically? Very briefly. I think, um, as President Xi said, we're actually at the best of time, right, uh, when we look back at the, uh, the history of the, the two sides' uh, relationship. Um, I think, um, you know, looking forward, um, the, in, the relationship will be further improved along the, uh, the commercial and economic side. There will be more investment coming from China in Africa. There will be more people from China uh, working and living in Africa. You know, the trade between the two sides need to be a balance, not just in good uh, trade of goods, uh, but probably more in, uh, in, in trade of services. Right. Uh, we, we need to import more services from Africa, uh, like see any more tourists from China to Africa. You know, there, there, are, there are a couple of ways to try to balance that trade, or at least uh, uh, moving towards uh, that direction. Uh, and, and I think that's probably um, you know something that uh, African leaders will definitely welcome and look forward to. Right, uh, Dr. Adera, very briefly. Well, I think today China, you know, obviously ranks as the most influential power in Africa. Uh, I mean, many surveys recently have indicated that more Africans approve of China's uh, presence and activities in the continent. 
just days ahead of OCAC, uh, the uh, survey results by the polling firm from South Africa, Family Foundation, indicated that up to 82% of Africans, especially young Africans, so the future of this collaboration, actually approve of Chinese presence in the continent. And this is because China's partnership with Africa, especially under the purview of OCAC, has delivered more value than any other Africa plus one arrangement that the continent has with any other major development partner. And so going forward, I hope that uh, the two sides can um, implement the action points <clears throat> that has come out of this uh, uh, summit and deliver you know, development across the many areas that uh, both sides have found to be mutually inclusive and beneficial. We are talking about inclusive trade. We are talking about investment in green energy transition. Africa is the home of the largest in renew renewables and China is the largest home of uh, re green energy technology. The two sides have comparative advantages that can suit their conditions and deliver value in a more inclusive, more environmentally sustainable, and more politically correct way. And I also look forward to seeing greater intercultural exchanges among the people of China and Africa to create understanding and dispel the myths and disinformation that has for long held uh, the relationship from really realizing its full potential. Dr. Matambo. There is a lot to be sanguine about uh, Africa's uh, uh, future with, with, in terms of its relationship with, uh, with, with China. We've already seen that there is a certain readiness on China to um, partner with the continent on crucial matters such as uh, uh, infrastructure uh, development. So I expect that uh, to continue as well. Um, in, in, in terms of uh, exchanges, and uh, I, I expect exchanges to continue, especially in the, in the crucial areas of health. It is quite heartening to hear uh, President Xi Jinping uh, talking about sending 2,000 health personnel on the app to come and uh, train some uh, some African personnel on the continent. That is something that should be uh, celebrated as well. The third thing that has been undermining uh, Africa is uh, the energy crisis in which uh, countries of Africa are engulfed upon. I think China has the requisite technology to exchange with China, to exchange with Africa to make sure that the continent's industrialization is ignited because it will remain chronically limited if at all we are still uh, mired in this energy crisis that currently prevails on the African continent. All right. Uh, thank you all very much for a lively discussion. But that's all we have time for on this special edition of Talk Africa. A big thank you to our guests, Dr. Adere Cavins, China-Africa expert, Dr. Emmanuel Matambo, research director at the University of Johannesburg, and Professor John Gong, professor at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. Remember, you can be a part of this conversation through our social media platforms on Facebook and X, and you can watch this and other editions of Talk Africa on our YouTube playlist. Do join us again next week for more at Talk Africa. For me, Beatrice Marshall and the team here in Nairobi. Until next time, it's bye-bye.